Christianity, at its core, believes that God created the world and declared it good, imbuing it with His presence and divine purpose. This foundational belief beautifully aligns with animist perspectives, which also recognize the spirit or life force in all elements of nature. Both traditions, therefore, encourage a heartfelt respect for the environment, viewing it as a manifestation of the divine. This shared value underscores the common ground between Christianity and animism, deepening the respect for creation. Moreover, animism's emphasis on community rituals and the honoring of ancestors can enrich Christian practices. These rituals offer a warm communal space that reinforce the Christian values of fellowship and honor for one's forebears. By integrating these practices, Christians can deepen their faith and strengthen their community bonds as expressed in the biblical commandment to honor your father and your mother. I started working as a public defender and representing folks that could not afford a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I kept seeing them go through this revolving door. So it hurt me to see that. It was like a factory. Somebody would commit a mistake and they'd come into the system and they would be processed and spit out. Have you ever felt your spiritual beliefs tugging at the edges of another tradition, hinting at a more profound connection? In this episode, our guest takes you on a journey through the intertwining paths of Christianity, animism, and Taoism, exploring how these faiths intersect to enrich spiritual practice and offer profound insights for personal growth. I'm John Moyer, your host. You are listening to the Urban Grief Shamans. Thank you for joining us. Please take a moment to subscribe to our show's mailing list using the link in the show notes and let us know what you think of today's show. I remember one time we asked him the question, well, what's it like to be you? What goes on in in your mind? And his immediate response was no rehearsing thoughts, Mm. no thoughts. And then he just giggled and walked away. And we started thinking about that. And we realized that this is somebody who doesn't have any conversation going on in their mind. They're just open and available. That is Bob Martin a former mob lawyer turned meditation teacher and mindfulness coordinator at Elon University. Today, Bob shares his profound transformation, guided by the ancient wisdom of Taoism and influenced by his unique personal history, from the tumultuous days in Miami to his peaceful practices in North Carolina. Bob, tell me about your spiritual awakening. I know there were big changes in your life. During your childhood, your parents weren't necessarily the emotive kind. And then the ancestral burden that your family carried down from the Bolsheviks. And do you call them gypsies or the travelers? Travelers, yeah. Not all Romas were gypsies or travelers. Some were founded, but many of them were. Not only having parents that immigrated themselves. Here in North Carolina, I have a lot of friends whose families go back to the Scottish pioneers and the like. And they've been here for 300 years, their families. And I think about my line in America, it goes back to when my father got here and then it takes a right turn, but then it doesn't go anywhere. It goes back to Hungary and we know something about that, but there's no ancestral, there's a thing there. So that kind of ancestral trauma certainly follows me, but it's nothing like having gone through the Trail of Tears or having had your ancestors enslaved for years and picked up out of their life. The ancestral trauma that some of our marginalized folks have today, I can't complain. That's true enough. But in the moment, I don't think that we ever have that choice. No matter how it comes to us, it's involuntary, like our reactions to it. I was just wondering, what was the forces behind your spiritual awakening? I worked for Janet Reno who later became the attorney general under the Clinton administration. I worked for her, and I was part of the Crimes and Consumer Frauds Task Force together with the feds, and we wound up hitting the mob for $72 million. Shortly after that, I left the office, hung my shingle out, and I'll call him Johnny, came to visit me, 
And basically the conversation was, you got to be pretty good to hit us for that much. Would you mind if I sent you some clients? And that's how it started. I got to know Johnny. And at that level in Miami, the Cubans and the Haitians, the Italians, Colombians and the Peruvians all were talking together at some level because they all assisted on the routes. Our deal was nothing illegal, nothing unethical. You want a lawyer that's respected, that's in your best interest. If I ever get caught doing something like that, it's going to come back and you. Yeah, worked out very well. They were always good for their word until his son got busted. And then there was no saying no to him. But during that period of time, a was going out with them a lot, going to a lot of those chrome and glass bars and maybe doing a lot of stuff that I shouldn't have been doing. And it was impacting my family life. Things were spiraling downward. So I was seeing a therapist. And one day I had, I was arrogant and I thought that I couldn't fail at anything. And I decided I was going to try to go into a business that was going to make me a million dollars. I was going to, I was going to be the richest person. It was great. It's wonderful. It wasn't working out because I wasn't working out. I had already paid my house off at 32. Wow. And I had to make a decision whether I was going to refinance my house to keep this business venture mm -hmm. going. So I went and I said, what should I do? He goes behind himself. He picks up a little bag with three Chinese coins in it, shakes the coins, drops them on the thing, looks at them, makes a couple of mathematical calculations, draws a line, picks them up, does it again and again six times till he drew six lines. And I'm aghast. I'm looking at this. I'm paying the guy 65 bucks an hour. He's throwing coins in the most important question of my life. Finally, he writes down a number out of his calculations, turns around, gets this book, opens it up to that chapter, and the title of the chapter is Retreat. I cursed him out, and I stomped out, and I thought that he was a witch doctor or something, at least thought he was. So I went to the office of the business, and I went in, and I said to everybody, we're closed. We're not going to make it. We're done. And I did not refinance my house. And I did not put myself into a position where I could not have gotten out of. With my tail between my legs, I go back a couple of weeks later and George, what was that? And he goes, oh, that was the I Ching. Turned out that my therapist was the English language editor for a 72nd generation Taoist master from the Shaolin Temple. Taoism itself, that Kung Fu and Tai Chi mm -hmm. and Qigong and Yin Yang balance, all of that. So I said, what's Taoism? It interested me because my family was atheist and I didn't have any kind of particular religious background, something I'd been searching for a long time. And here was something that gave me a pathway to live life in a virtuous and proper, efficient and effective way. That didn't require me to have to believe in anything supernatural. So I loved it. I just took to it. And I studied under George Master Nee, came to Miami often. And he had to be the happiest man that I'd ever run into in my life. A shaman? Yes. We would play hide and seek with him and we could never find him. That's just how he was. He was just the most amazing fellow. I remember one time we asked him the question, well, what's it like to be you? What goes on in, in your mind? And his immediate response was no rehearsing thoughts, mm. no thoughts. And then he just giggled and walked away. And we started thinking about that. And we realized that this is somebody who doesn't have any conversation going on in their mind. They're just open and available. And when something happens, they respond to it like, a basketball player who's in the zone responds mm -hmm. to what's going on around them. There's no effort involved. There's just responsiveness. And that in Taoism is known as Wu Wei, which means doing, not doing. The funniest thing is that Wu, the word Wu, is also Chinese for shaman. So there is something mystical about all of Taoism. Was I know the three coins and the tossing of the coins struck me as a very shamanic process. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like divination. I Ching was the practice that 
changed me. It's one thing to study under a master, but you have to do practice. And every morning I would get up and get my coins. I'd get three quarters and throw them six times and write the appropriate lines and divine them to go to the appropriate chapter and read it. And over time, what the I Ching taught me was how to recognize the energy that is around me and be able to understand how I could become effective and efficient. Kind of what I mean by that is certainly we have all come into times when we have a great and wonderful idea and nobody wants to listen to us, right? Yes. We've all experienced that. The I Ching would label that time darkening of the light. You're too bright and you need to darken your light a bit. It would advise you that in a time when nobody's listening to you, it's better not to speak and use the time to work internally so that when the time changes and people are open to your ideas, you have it all together so that you can make your case clearly and authentically. The I Ching defines 64 pie slices of different times. There's a time to advance, a time to retreat, a time to wait, a time to speak, a time of great progress, a time of walking in mud. There are all these different times. And as you practice the I Ching, you become more familiar with being able to quickly recognize the time you're in and not work against it, not try to row your river, row your boat upstream, rather navigate it carefully downstream and life becomes easier, become happier. You spoke of the recognizing the energy that is external to you and reading from that. Is there an equivalent of reading the energy that's inside you? Yeah, that comes from contemplation and meditation. Mm -hmm. And it, in Taoism, a lot of the ways of uh, becoming familiar with the internal energies through movement, like Tai Chi. And if you've ever seen advanced Tai Chi, the pushing of hands, where two people stand opposite each other and they feel the force that goes between them. In doing that, they get a physical sensation of the yin and yang forces and the balance between yin and yang. And they begin to be able to recognize that energy also in conversation. Also, in task, in doing tasks and the like. So they feel it physically and are able to then transpose that feeling to life. In Buddhism, it's much more mental, where you meditate and really step back into a different ego state of being an observer to your thoughts mm -hmm. and watch your thoughts and become detached from them in a certain way so that when you become angry, you get to be angry and express your anger at the same time from a detached place, watch yourself being angry and maybe even be giggling at it, even as you're angry. And so it, it makes you much more resilient. And again, it all goes back to everything passes. I had an experience somewhat like that. I was a paramedic in Bushtox near an accident scene. We were unable to access the crew on scene due to the multi-lane nature of this roadway. We went on, and the communication center came back and saying, well, why did you do that? And they were upset with us because we were multiple lanes we would have to cross, so we were not going to do that. But I remember during the conversation with the comm center, I was seething. And, and I thought for sure the supervisor was going to come and visit and tell me about my on-air manners. And uh, anyways, he did come by and he did bring a recording of the, the whole thing. And when I was listening to my communications with the comm center, I sounded quiet and completely opposite to the way I was feeling inside. And I thought for sure I was going to get busted. But So I don't know if it's the same thing, but that idea of how we can somehow separate the two, what we're feeling and what we're expressing. It's almost like we're two souls at once or something. So are there other teachings that kind of help contribute towards your transformation that you were starting to go through? So when I came to North Carolina, one of the things that transformed about me that was different was that I became much gentler and much more aware the effect that I had on folks and much more aware of myself and therefore able to read others' energies. And I was doing criminal law at the time. I started working as a public defender and representing folks that 
could not afford in a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I kept seeing them go through this revolving door. So it hurt me to see that. It was like a factory. Somebody would commit a mistake and they'd come into the system and they would be processed and spit out and go do whatever they had to do and then come out. And of course, they're no support. And it hurt. So I closed my practice and I went back to school and got a social work master's degree. And in that, I concentrated in my studies on positive psychology and science. When I came back, I went back and reopened my law office. And then I was able to commit to listening to my client. And I was committed to this. I could not guarantee, of course, what would happen. I couldn't. It was my job to advocate for their best interest. But the ultimate result is that they may go to jail or be placed on probation or get some consequence. And no matter what their consequence was, it was my commitment that when they left my presence, they will have felt heard, listened to, that somebody stood up for them, and that they understood why what was happening to them was happening to them. I didn't want them to go out with a narrative of, I'm a victim, I've been mishandled, it's unfair. Even if it was unfair, let's understand all the dynamics of why was it unfair. And since then, I've seen a lot of my clients have done their whatever they needed to do and have gotten much more productive lives. And sometimes I run into them on the street and they tell me what a difference that made to them. That lesson that I learned once of how important it is for a person to be heard has stayed with me for a while. And that's a driving force within me. Did you have any insight that what path you might have been on when you're younger? I think it was recorded that you're, you weren't necessarily well-liked for different reasons. The girls didn't care for you. So it must have been that idea of loneliness. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but shame from not that something was wrong with you. At least that's how I would have thought about myself. I've been there. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. As you're moving forward on this incredible life that you have. Yeah, I think about that a bit. When I was young, all the girls in starting about second grade, I was a hefty boy. In those days, the word was husky. I remember my mother, I would go in with my hand in her hand into J.C. Penney's and in her loud Latvian voice, she would go, where's the Husky apartment. And so all the girls called me cooties and they ran away whenever I came near. There are two things I think that saved me. One is that I had a friend. I had Charlie Greenfield. He was my friend. And he stood by me and didn't matter what everybody else felt. All the other boys, they wanted to be popular with the girls. So they went along with it. And but not Charlie Greenfield. And there was this one person there who loved me. And later on in life, when I finally realized how important he was to me, we were both in college separated by about 500 miles. I called him in the middle of the night to tell him that. And after he heard me go on and on with it, he said, can I go back to bed now? No. <laughs> <laughs> but then he wrote me a letter and he wrote me a short story about how I was in an ice cream parlor and how the cooties, a cootie had come in, the plastic game cootie. Yes. And as I was, we were fixated on each other and slowly it began to smoke and melt into a puddle and disappear. And the cootie was gone. And he was quite a friend. And I had a friend who kept telling me I should be a lawyer. And he wasn't working, and he went out and got a job, and he earned $356, which was the entrance fee for the law school aptitude test. And he bought a money order in that amount, and he gave it to me. He said, you should be a lawyer. You should go take this test. So I couldn't say no, right? So mm -hmm. I did surprisingly well, and I got admitted to a law school that took a chance on me. And I graduated eventually, and John stayed with me all through that. And two days after I was sworn in, he died. 
Oh, my. Did so, he have any sense that he was unwell? No, he had been a heroin addict and he, all through the time that I was in law school and he was going to community college and I was going to be Perry Mason and he was going to be my Paul Drake. But he stayed with me, he was clean, and then somehow he met a girl and he decided to use and his tolerance wasn't there anymore and he overdosed. But I have always felt that Tom was, John was here for that very particular reason. It's given my life purpose and meaning. And there's w just one other thing. Even though my folks were atheists because all of their ancestors had been wiped out by either the Bolsheviks or the Nazis, my father made me go to children's Bible school, children's Sunday school, to a service. We never studied anything. But I had to go to, because he said, we are Americans, and you must know the Bible stories. And if you're going to be an American, you must know the Bible stories. He, so he took me all the time, and I would go into Sunday school class. All of the stuff like Noah's Ark and all that stuff was kind of Disney to me. But there was one consistent message that I kept hearing in all those Sunday schools, and that was that there was some guy, and... He was undefined. I was quite exactly sure what or who he was. And he was out in the universe somewhere. He wasn't on the earth, but that he loved me. I accepted the fact that there was this guy somewhere who I did not understand that loved me. Between Charlie Greenfield and John and this divine being that loved me, it gave me, I think, the strength to challenge the challenges. Yeah, and you're referring to Jesus? Yes. I see. You became a meditation teacher. And did you carry that into your law practice? Yes, certainly. I didn't, not meditation teaching so much as my practice. When you're in trial, you have to be very aware of a lot of stuff that's going on in the courtroom. If you want to be a good lawyer, you have to get a sense of what's going on over there in the jury box, what's going on in the witness box, what's going on with the judge. And having that kind of specific focus was helped by my practice a lot. Being able to remember what somebody said so that if they're saying something different now. In trial work, it helped a lot. But even in the practice of talking to the clients in the office, in the interviews, trust that was built came quickly. When you are representing indigent folks and they're not paying you, they immediately have a sense that you're not really on their side because you, they're not paying you. And a lot of times they'll say, hey, if I pay, if I gave you $30 or $50 or $100, would you be able to be a better lawyer for me? You have to be able to get through that initial distrust and build a relationship. And again, that goes back to listening and being authentic, and being truthful, and being able to give bad news in a way that can be digested. So all of that comes in with meditation practice. Was it hard to tie in Buddhism and Christianity? My, my Christianity was very Jesus-focused. Uh, I never spent a lot of time except for the stories, deeply into the Old Testament. But don't see that there's a hair's breadth of difference between the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of Lao Tzu. It might seem heretical. Honestly and authentically, I really think that there are some indications and there's some great books called The Lost Years of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. that make a strong case that Jesus traveled in India and up to Tibet and believe that because when he came back, he taught Buddhism. That's what he taught. All of his teachings are Buddhist teachings. I'm not saying that he wasn't divinely inspired. That's above my pay grade. I don't know, but it certainly is synchronistic. Is there, are there, is there room 
within the legal profession or in the courts to, to speak from the heart? Is that something lawyers learn? The best criminal defense attorneys are heartfelt. You wouldn't think so. It seems like it's counterintuitive, but it's not. They really passionately, they can, that's why they relate to a jury so well. They are able to represent their clients because they are truly heartfelt and passionate about what they do. There is room for it. There are those who think that it's all about fighting and advocacy and the like, but it's really about finding a common ground. So it's not something that's formally taught in your meditation or mindfulness. Just to one big question is that, can you tell me a little bit more about the, the book that you have? What's it cover? I grew up as an atheist, then a Taoist, then a Buddhist, and a lover of Jesus. And so that's where I am, but with no real Bible training. And I get to North Carolina, wind up divorcing my first wife and opening a little sub shop here by the university and fall in love with this woman, Connie, who worked side by side with me to open that restaurant and then ran my law office and now runs my life. And <laughs> we got, and we got married and she is a Bible literalist. She believes in Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and the Noah's Ark, that these are historical facts. And so you would say, how does it come to be that I would yes. find such a woman attractive? But in Buddhism, we have a word, a bodhisattva. She is a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva that is a saint. In Buddhism, a bodhisattva is someone that chooses to cross over into nirvana so that they can stay in the trouble of the earth to help others get there. And you think what a giving nature that would be. That is who she is. Okay, and, I was wondering where uh, the word came from. Yeah. yeah, and that's really who she is. She's just a wonderful, giving, loving, very detailed, and I need that because I'm a big picture person. And But it was impossible for us to talk about our cosmologies or our belief systems. She would feel that I was imposing and selling her things like the world is only 4,000 years old. Uh -huh. And I quickly learned not to say, how do you account for dinosaurs? I just, she goes, Bob, this works for me. It's what I grew up with. I'm very happy with the way I live my life. And so that was it. But Taoism and seminal main book of Taoism is called the Tao Te Ching, which means the classical book of the way of virtue. Tao means the way. And I would read it, and I, I, as a devotional, I always have, I always do as part of my practice. And I would say, there's nothing different about this than what she believes. She believes in humility. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. This is what is taught. And I started looking at some of the couplets in the Tao Te Ching and saying, how could I put this in Christian terms? How could I say the same thing in a biblical reference? So I started studying the Bible. And you love Google because you can ask it, what does the Bible have to say about humility? And it'll give you 20, 30 sites. And I would read through them until I found one that was right on point. And I grab it. And then it was just a matter of adjusting the rhythm and the rhyme so that it took the same feel as the Tao Te Ching without using mm -hmm. the same words. And I, I'd finish one of the chapters, and then i said, can I read this to you? And I'd read it. She goes, what? where did you get that from? And I said, I got it from this over there. Let me see. So she'd read it. He says, how did you get that from this? I said, it took a little work. And she goes, wow, that's really good. I like that. And so that was my motivation. I did another chapter. Finally, I did all 81 chapters. And I, and she was always waiting. She said, read me another one. Read me another one. And at one point, she finally said to me, she said, Bob, I've been going to church all my life, and there has never, no preacher 
has ever explained Jesus to me this well. And now I understand Jesus like I never have before. And I said, wow, if that, if that has an effect like that you, says a maybe lot. it says a lot, maybe I can get it published. And so Kendall Hunt picked it up and traditionally published it. And I'm just so excited about it. It's, it intrigues me, to tell you the truth. And uh, I wasn't brought up despite my parents' efforts of the church. and But I'm always open to just other ways of looking at similar things. And so I'll take a look at that. But to, would, you like me to, would you like me to read a passage? A, a short one, just so it's we have a, a yeah, taste. They're all short. They're all short. They're all a half a page. They're all short. Okay. Between 1 and 81. Just to be, let's be random. Uh, you're 77, right? 77? Yeah, no, I'm 74. Oh, let's go for 74. Okay. So every, oh, that's a short one. That's good. Every one of them, I gave a title to the chapter, and I found a quote from some famous quote that I liked. The title of this chapter is Life and Death. And the quote came from Norman Cousins. It says, death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what dies inside us while we live. It's a good one. I like this one. Good choice. I like them all. But here you go. It reads this way. Thou shalt not kill. Is that not clear? Perhaps there is a need for further definition. Love your enemies. Do not resist an evil person. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. The Lord went even further. He counseled not only against destroying the body, but also not to kill another's hope, spirit, or faith. People live their lives fearing death. Would it not be better to live life loving life? In God's creation, there's a time to live and a time to die. Thus God appointed nature as the official executioner. To have the arrogance to substitute oneself for nature is like a child seeking to cut wood with the tools of a master carpenter. All that will be left is ruined wood and wounded hands. Thank you for joining us today and sharing Bob Martin's transformation from a mob lawyer to a meditation teacher. His journey illustrates the power of change and redemption through spiritual awakening. Bob's integration of Taoist wisdom and other spiritual principles serves as a beacon of hope, showcasing the profound impact of faith and introspection on life. Until our next episode, keep seeking, keep growing, and remember that even the longest journey unfolds step by step. Thank you for listening, and take care.